Welcome to another Word in Your Ear recorded live at our recent Word in the Park event in Holland Park. The third of our guests was John Higgs. Now, 60 years ago, I was a 12-year-old schoolboy enthralled to two entertainment phenomena which had recently emerged, the Beatles and James Bond. Actually, at the time, we didn't know they were phenomena. They were just the new thing. We had no idea that either of them would outlast the decade, let alone still be part of our lives today. We didn't realize that both of them would, in their different ways, change the ways in which the British looked to themselves. And this is explored in this wonderful book, Love and Let Die, The Beatles, James Bond, and the British Psyche. So the person to talk about it is its author, John Higgs. You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Excellent. Hello, indeed. So, so John... Uh, yes, they, they are as 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 the book starts out by saying they are kind of spookily aligned, aren't they? They, they? they both tell us about how they both came along. Well, they are twins. They were they were born on the same day. The very first James Bond film, Doctor No, and the very first Beatles record, uh, Love Me Do That Seven Inch, um, appeared on the fifth of October, nineteen sixty-two. Quite a, a miserable sort of October you know, Friday afternoon, these two things suddenly uh, um, appeared. And the thing with both of them is neither of them really make any sense. Right? They're utterly implausible. You know, if, um, like the idea that you could come up with an action hero uh, and then make like 25 sequels to that thing <laughs> over 60 years, all of which make money, you know, all of which is a success. It's impossible, right? And if it was possible, every film producer, they'd be doing that. And if it wasn't for the fact that Bond exists, you know, it would sound insane. Uh, and also with the Beatles, the idea that, you know, four mates could get together and have the sort of impact yeah. or uh, produce the body of work in that short period of time as the Beatles, no one believes that's in any way possible. So they don't sort of fit with the rest of the culture in some ways, in, in normal entertainment. It's, you know, it's, they're just oddities. They're um, monsters. And it sort of made more sense to look at them together than to, like, look at Beatles in terms of 60s bands or James Bond in terms of action heroes. Um, because there's never been the like and there never will be again. So... so Bond is kind of nothing to do with the film business, really. And, and Beatles are nothing to do with the music business. They're yeah, they're more than that. It's, it's, an, it's an odd thing. They both sort of came along at a point uh, in Britain. And, of course, they're globally massively successful. But in, in Britain, it was just a few years after, like, the Suez Crisis, you know. And even those people who, you know, clang, cling to the idea of the British Empire, even those people had to go, yeah, we're... We're not that anymore, are we? You know, we're not a massive power. Britain has sort of changed. And it kind of left the question of, well, if we're not that, you know, then what are we? Because right. there's so much about, so many different themes as mm. uh, kind of uh, pointed up by, by both of them. One is class. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that Bond is this kind of uh, uh, upper class, kind of uh, arrogant, entitled kind of character, the original Bond. Mm. And Beatles, obviously, working class. And there's a bit in it where I think Hanif Karishi talks about being at school and saying that they were taught at school that the Beatles didn't write their own songs because how could a working class... They just exactly. assumed that I someone was writing them for them. That was one of the things that made me want to write the book when, yeah. I, when I read that. There's, it's a wonderful es essay by Hanif Qureshi. It's on the British Museum, uh, sorry, the British Library website. Uh, but when he was in school somewhere in Kent, his music teacher, as you say, uh, taught them that the Beatles were a hoax. And it had to have been, you know either George Martin or Brian Epstein writing these songs because they, they were more cultured. They were, you know, they were better spoken. They were sort of a bat, better class of people. And Hanif Qureshi, he writes this really perceptive thing where he says he came to realise that his music teacher had to believe this 
because if he didn't, it would take too much else away. <laughs> His entire yeah. worldview that he'd been taught at the, you know, the private schools that he'd been, he'd been sent to um, was based on the idea that those people from that background, uh, from those families with that sort of education, you know, were best, right? Uh, and if it was the case that, you know, talent, creativity, hard work, dedication, imagination, if like attributes like that were just sprinkled randomly like throughout the population, um, then the implications like, was too frightening to think about. It would mean that the country, you know, wasn't run by the brightest and the best or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. It was just run by the children of the rich who were statistically likely to be not good enough. Yeah. So, it was a, it was a, so the Beatles were a real challenge to the establishment at this point. So when, you know, Harold Wilson uh, gave them all MBEs and got the Queen to give them all MBEs, he really, it, was a, it was a really astute thing he was doing. It was a really political act. And the, the people who, um, of the establishment who had honours, who were furious and who were sending them back, and who were writing angry letters to the Times, thinking that they'd been devalued because people were saying, they're as good as the Beatles, and they were appalled by this. This was a real you know, shift in, in um, how Britain understood itself. I always, it's very striking that you know, before the Beatles, the, the notion that like, if someone's got a bowler hat or, some, or someone like that, they, they deserve deference. Yeah. And at the end of the Beatles, it's totally gone. And so you get like Monty Python and the upper class twits and all that sort of stuff yeah. in the 70s. It's that, it's that period in the 60s where it, it, just, it just rots away. I, yeah. I, I, love the, I love the detail that you pick out in this book. I mean, there's so many kind of odd coincidental moments where the, the world of the Beatles and the world of Bond meet. Mm. I think Richard Vernon, the, great, the late great Richard Vernon, the character actor, who always played gentleman with a moustache and uh, yeah. with wearing a bowler hat, is the disapproving adult in the railway carriage in a hard in day's night. Day's night. Yeah. Yeah. And he's also playing kind of the same part in... In, a in Goldeneye, and, uh, not Goldeneye, sorry, Goldfinger. Goldfinger. Goldfinger and A Hard Day's Night both came out at the, at the same year. Um, and they're fascinating, and they're both brilliant. You know, they're, yeah, they're they both are. listed in the top 100 British films and all this sort of thing. Um, but they're both so different. The Hard Day's Night, it's not a documentary, but it's got that sort of black and white cinema verite sort of style. And it's, it shows you sort of a, a, a long gone Britain of like milk vending machines and, you know, smoking on trains and bombed out churches and all this sort of stuff. Whereas the Bond film, it's all glamour and traveling the world and color and all these sort of things. But of course, they're made in the same culture by a lot of the same people. So there's all these weird crossovers. Richard Vernon being in both films, playing a very similar role is kind of one. And it's that fantastic scene on the train where he sort of comes in and he wants the window open and they want it closed or vice versa. But he thinks because he, of his status, uh, he should have his way and they're like four little like oiks. Um, that notion of whether a bowler hat was something to be mocked or something to be admired was like, the Brit Britain was trying to work out the time in Goldeneye, in, sorry, Goldfinger. I'm obsessed with Goldeneye. Um, it's a <laughs> weapon. Like the bowler hat is fearful. It's a weapon. Like odd job will sort of have your head off with it and sort of things like that. Um, and in the, in the same film, R um, Ringo gets an invite to this gambling club, which is exactly the same gambling club where we first meet James Bond in Dr. No, uh, Le Cirque Rooms in the Ambassadors. Uh, and like uh, Wilfred Bramble gets the, the invite and nicks it. And uh, this is pretending yeah. to be Paul's very clean uncle. And he sort of goes along and he's, you know, he's, he's saying souffle and getting everything wrong. But they're just, they're just, they've just walked into the, the world of, you know, James Bond and they're just having a right laugh there. It's, it's, it's the amount of joy in The Hard Day's Night. It's the amount of humour and fun and energy and stuff that is such a, makes a, such a striking you know, comparison to, to the, the James Bond world. So what did James Bond in inverted commas, think of the Beatles, and what did the Beatles think of James Bond? Well, there's, this, there's a, a scene in, in that same film, in Goldfinger, where James Bond, like, slags off the Beatles. Uh, and he says something along the lines of, um, 
oh, drinking such a such a wine below such a temperature, it's as bad as listening to the Beatles without earmuffs. And it's it really clangs. It's a crap joke, it's, isn't it's it? Really, it's odd because the whole point of James Bond is he knows what's good. Yes. He knows what's best. He, he knows what to wear. He knows the food to order. Was he there a reaction the to that? I think there was a reaction in that James Bond has never, ever commented on like culture ever again. Ever really? got it. So <laughs> it's just not his work. You just do not know what... You can't what, get it right. You it kind do of not know sense, what he thinks because James Bond is bigger album. than them, isn't he, really? Yeah, he is. And it's at, at that point, when they were making the second film, Help, you know, to be in the Beatles at that point must have been the best thing ever. You know, they, 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 had to, they were so tight. They were so close. They were the best gang of mates ever. They would got to the top of their, you know, career tree. They, they, they were the most loved entertainers in the entire world. They could do anything they, they liked. They had the money pouring in. Everything was brilliant. Um, and yet everybody sort of needs a... A fantasy and a goal or aim, and and the only thing that they didn't have was being James Bond. So for that film, they're they're trying to make a Bond film. Yeah. They're trying to put themselves in the world of James Bond um, to the extent that it's got you know you know chases in the Alps with exploding you know things and um, you know scenes set in the Bahamas uh, for tax reasons more than plot reasons you know they're make, making this sort yeah. of spoof Bond film because it's, it's the um, it's that weird thing about James Bond which no other film hero really has he has this weird way of sort of almost like whispering to you you'd, you'd quite like to have my life wouldn't you, Would you you'd quite like to live like me isn't it? it's not it's not you don't get that with like Jason Bourne, you know. No one fantasizes about Jason yeah, Bourne. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. You know, yeah. It's very difficult, but it's and it's not what men should be, and it's not what men you know need to be. It's what like what men want to be. Well, so, the theme of masculinity is really interesting in the book too, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, you know the bond, that whole idea that boys thought they had to be courageous and combative, and suddenly the Beatles come along. Absolutely, a completely different kind of masculinity. You, you were brought up to be male. You had to be like good at fighting, right? And it's just after the war. Yeah, and it was all those war comics where there was you know, clear baddies you had to fight, and you, if you were good at fighting, you could protect your parents and your, you know, the girl. You could protect girls and stuff like that. And it was a real shock to that generation that the girls just didn't actually want that. There was these hairy guys who looked incredibly yeah, effeminate. Yeah. They were talking about emotions and like yeah, you no know, sing, to kill, singing it, about all, love, yeah. and that's what the girls really wanted. And yeah. that, that was that was such a such a uh, surprise to, to a large part of the population. And then you see, come the seventies, everyone's going around with this lovely glowing hair, and everyone's clothes have completely changed, and this huge sort of sort of shift there's no one really ha I mean there's a lot happened in the 60s and it's not all the Beatles fault obviously but there was this point where they, they were the most loved entertainers on the planet and they just sort of sucked up everything in the avant-garde and in the counterculture anything that interested them they just sucked it all up and they turned it into gold and they just sprayed it over the mainstream and there's never been, you know, like a, a transmission vector for ideas or cultural changes like it. It was, it was, it was extraordinary sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I, I get I, a point to get like this. I just wanted to sort of just rant about just, just how we. I mean, you said it yourself, David Heffer, how the Beatles are underrated. You know, it's, it's as we get further and further away, we get a greater perspective on them. And as they sort of become our folk music, the sort of the music that, that every, everybody knows, we realise how different they are to, um, you know, no, no insult or no shade on any other 60s band or something like that. But in the same way that Shakespeare is like bigger than like, you know, 16th century theatre, even though that's totally illogical, but he is, the Beatles are sort of bigger than, you know, pop music in the late 20th century. Let's talk about hair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, hair is a is really dividing line, isn't it, with the Beatles and Bond? Abs oh, God, absolutely. Because um, it was the... I mean, there's always, we talk a lot about culture wars now, but there always are culture wars, and they always look a bit ridiculous, like, you know, 10, 20 years later, because they, 
they tend to not really be about the thing that everyone's arguing about. Um, when we, at the time, the length of hair on men was such a cultural dividing point that it looks daft now. Uh, but really, it was about much deeper things, about much deeper sort of mm. changes going on. Uh, and so you had, uh, you know, the second James Bond, George Lazenby. He was um, ordered not to come to the premiere of his one and only Bond film on Her Majesty's Secret Service because he'd sort of grown his hair a bit and he had a beard and he looked a bit like, you know, uh, George Best. or t- No brill cream? No, no, no brill cream at Best all. And for Cubby Broccoli, uh, it was... It was so um, contentious. It was so wrong. It seems odd now, because obviously an actor can have different hair to the character they play, and, and, and that's and that sort of... Thing. And he forbid him from going to America and all this. And as far as George Lazenby could see, essentially, the Beatles had won. You know, it was, it was make love, not war. The idea of playing a role who was an establishment killer at that point, was seemed so old hat and so um, wrong. That as, as he looked at it and he just thought, well, it's over, surely. Surely James Bond is over. Well, I think you make the point that the Beatles are the only band who ever uh, kind of reshaped the world in their image. No yeah. other band has been uh, capable of doing that. And, and, and it's a brilliant bit where you're talking about the rooftop Savile Row gig. Mm. And you see them, and the camera pans down, and you realise that they look contemporary. They yeah. look contemporary now, actually. And then you realise that's the world they're in. People yeah. with posh people with bowler hats trying to stop this noise, you know. Absolutely. And, uh, that's what comes across in Get Back, if, any, if everyone's watched I'm sure everyone's watched Get Back. Lots of nodding heads about what's great. Yeah. But, you, you know, you've got, eight, you've got about eight odd hours of rehearsals for their second worst album and it was the best thing we saw on TV that year <laughs> and you spend so long with them and you get to know them and you get to know how they relate to each other and sort of how emotionally mature they are with each other uh, and uh, how, how likeable and intelligent they are and you get to know that and it's only in the last episode when the cameras go outside and you see the bowler hats yeah. and, you know, the clipped accents and the, the headscarves and stuff the like that. And past. you're like, this is a long time ago. This is the part. They, they seem like modern day yes. people just trapped, you know, yeah. in a world that had not yet caught up with them. It's those two. It's the first and the last album cover. Well, the, the, the last recorded. If you look at the, the cover of um, the very first album when they're looking over, please, please me, when they're looking over the balcony. And they're just like some lads, right? And they're, they're, they're some, some cheeky lads. And then it was literally, was it six and a half years later, the photo for the last recorded album where they're walking across Abbey Road and they're these four strange, hairy sort of men who look so different. But it's, it's not even that... Um, it's, it's like in, when that first photograph was taken, it's not that there wasn't people like that around. It was that the people like that with the ideas that they had and the values that they had and the interests that they had was just unimaginable. No one could have conceived well, of those late it, Beatles at that point. Was it point. Michael yeah. Braun, though, who wrote that fantastic early book about the Beatles, the American journalist, who said there are, there are a new kind of people? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I and it's like, they were a new kind of people, but they were real. James Bond was kind of a new kind of person, but he was invented. Yeah, he was, he was, he was very much a fantasy. What, what fascinates me about... The, but once, once I had the notion of putting the two of them together, there was something about that context where they both started to reveal so much about each other. All this stuff started to pour out of things that, that we thought, well, we know those. We know the Beatles. We know James Bond. They're in our lives. They've always been in our lives. You know, they're nothing new. It's just suddenly get a new perspective on them. And, and for me, it was they, the, the way their values clashed. They had very different values. I was talking a little bit about how Britain wanted an idea of itself as something new, as something modern, right? And they both offered this. You know, for James Bond, it was like, you know, it was like gadgets, and it was like flying to glorious sunny places, and it, it was like great clothes and great... It was, it was like the world will be materially better. We'll have, like, better things. But at the same time, it's like, but our attitudes... No, they're not changing. 
you know, our, our attitudes to, you know, women, our attitudes to foreigners, or those sort of things. We'll keep those attitudes to class, we'll keep those as they are. And the Beatles was just the exact opposite, because they liked old things. You know, the, the, the faux Victoriana of, you know, Sergeant Pepper, or you know, those songs about their childhood, Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields. They were really happy to embrace old things. But for them to be modern, it was just change the attitudes. You know, change attitudes to sex, to drugs, to religion, to all those sort of things, think differently. So you've got this weird, I mean, I, I describe it in the book as a clash between love and death because it's just, it's just too obvious and I can't avoid, I couldn't resist, you know. But it is, it is um, it, you do get a sense of a country struggling to sort of work out who it should be in this strange, you know, new modern world. Well, it's absolutely fascinating. It's all there in, in Love and Let Die, Bond, The Beatles and the British Psyche. Thank you, John Higgs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. And-